Before we begin, I want to give a special thanks to the men and women over at the Jim Gatchell Museum in Buffalo, Wyoming. Thank you so much for letting me film in your museum, and hopefully I can do this story justice. In 2016, the Wyoming State Historical Society selected its Artifact of the Year from a collection of top-tier artifacts from around the state, including a 50-million-year-old fossilized turtle, mountain man Jim Bridger's powder horn, and a 200-pound stone engraved with a haiku by a Japanese man interned during World War II. From these artifacts and more, the artifact the society selected as the most significant was this, a banged up bugle found in the hills along modern day Interstate 90. So why? What's so important about this old bugle? Well, to answer that, we have to start an ocean away over a century and a half ago where political and social upheaval is rocking the German states. Millions of people eventually flee the old country and settle in the US. During the 19th century, Germans made up the largest group of immigrants to America. Among these millions of immigrants was a young kid named Adolf Metzger. There's no known photographs of Metzger, and as we'll see, Metzger played fast and loose with his age, so we don't even know for sure how old he was. What we do know is on May 29, 1855, the 5 foot, 5 inch tall Metzger enlisted into the US Army and told his recruiter he was 21 years old. Just like now, joining the Army was a popular choice for immigrants. Although the pay was low, you did get fed, housed, and clothed. It gave you an opportunity to learn the language and customs of your new homeland. And if you looked healthy enough and were going to be a solid soldier, the recruiter didn't ask too many questions about stuff like your actual age. Young Metzger served the majority of his enlistment out west with the army and was discharged when his enlistment expired in 1860. After a few months of civilian life, Metzger re-enlisted and told this recruiter he was 24 years old so he'd only aged three years in a five-year time span. Sort of weird. Of course, a short time after Metzger rejoined the army, the Civil War broke out. Metzger served throughout the war, and in July 1864 signed up with Company C, 2nd U.S. Cavalry in Virginia. A few weeks after his enlistment, Metzger married Frederica Cooper in Philadelphia. According to his service records, Metzger had had a bit of a growth spurt. He'd grown three inches since his first enlistment and now gave his age as 25. So on paper, he'd only aged one year since 1860. Now army officers during this time relied on a combination of personal leadership and effective communication to win battles. Personal leadership meant that they had to lead from the front where they could accurately perceive the tactical situation and give the correct commands. And in order to communicate those commands to the rank and file soldiers, officers relied on field musicians. The cavalry relied solely on buglers. It's tough to play a drum on horseback. During battles, these musicians had to stay close to their commanding officers in the thick of the fighting so they could disseminate the right order from the boss to the troops. A Civil War bugler had to know more than 80 calls that controlled every facet of a soldier's life, from waking up in the morning to when to water your horse to which direction to turn and charge the enemy. And aside from a saber, it's the cavalry, everybody gets a saber. The army figured that if you were doing your job correctly, it would take both hands to use your instrument on horseback. So the army did not authorize weapons for buglers. Metzger's regiment served in some of the most intense battles of the war. At the Third Battle of Winchester, one month after Metzger's wedding, Metzger's commanding officer was shot during a massive cavalry charge and ended up losing his right arm. At the end of the war, the volunteer army, the great mass of men who had signed up to fight, were disbanded and sent home. But Metzger had enlisted into the regular army and still had two years left on his contract. So in the fall of 1866, Adolf Metzger, now a corporal and bugler for Company C, 2nd U.S. Cavalry, rode west towards Fort Phil Kearney. Although there were some Civil War veterans in Metzger's unit, many of the privates had recently enlisted and were inexperienced. Metzger's commander was 2nd Lieutenant Horatio Bingham. Bingham had enlisted at the beginning of the war and had been wounded at Antietam. After the war ended, Bingham had accepted a commission into the cavalry. Metzger's company also rode towards Fort Phil Kearney with another soon-to-be-famous name, Captain William Fetterman. Company C's arrival at Fort Phil Kearney gave the fort's commander, Colonel Henry Carrington, a powerful option to use against the Lakota and Cheyenne war parties that were harassing his post. His other units were all infantry. Carrington's superiors were urging him to wage a winter campaign against the Indian villages and his lower ranking officers also wanted to take the fight to the enemy. But Carrington delayed. He'd never actually led troops in the field before. On the afternoon of December 6th, a war party attacked a wagon train near the fort, which finally pushed Carrington towards offensive action. His plan was simple. 
One unit under Captain Fetterman would relieve the wagon train and then pursue the warriors over Lodge Trail Ridge, while Carrington, with another detachment, would block their retreat. Classic hammer and anvil stuff. Lieutenant Bingham's cavalry accompanies Fetterman's command, but during Fetterman's pursuit, the pursued warriors suddenly turn and engage Fetterman's outnumbered men. Bingham's inexperienced troopers ride off, and Bingham with them, leaving Fetterman no choice but to dismount and fight off the hundred-strong warrior attack with only 14 men. Meanwhile, Carrington is having issues of his own. When Lieutenant George Grumman, who is riding with Carrington, impetuously breaks ranks and charges after a group of warriors, Carrington orders him recalled and says if he cannot follow orders, he will send Grumman back to the fort. While Fetterman and his men are fighting for their lives, Carrington maneuvers to the north of the large war party. Again, Grumman leaves Carrington's command and apparently joins Bingham and a few other troopers chasing a small war party eastward. It's at this point that Carrington first mentions Corporal Metzger in his official report, although not by name. But six men turned the point, with one, a young bugler of the 2nd Cavalry, who told me that Lieutenant Bingham had gone down the road around the hill to the right. This seemed impossible, as he belonged to Captain Fetterman's command. I sounded the recall on his report, but in vain. In the confusion, Metzger had followed Bingham, his commanding officer, but then reported to Carrington, his commander's movement. As Fetterman unites with Carrington and the combined force moves towards where Metzger had indicated Bingham was, they see Grummond, furiously galloping, being chased by a group of Indians. Grumman tells them he and Bingham were chasing a few warriors when they were surprised and overwhelmed by a larger group. Further up, they find a sergeant who's been tomahawked to his brain. He dies a few hours later. After searching the area, Carrington finally finds Bingham's stripped and mutilated body. In his report, Carrington wrote, By the decease of Lieutenant Bingham, all clue is lost to his leaving his commanding officer or his object. If he left to join my party, he neglected to report to me. His sergeant says his horse ran away with him, and the lieutenant told him he could not hold him. The December 6th skirmish leaves Metzger and his company without an officer. It also sparks an idea among the native war chiefs. Next time, they're going to try and lure a larger group of soldiers into a trap they can't escape. In only 15 days, they execute their new battle plan with incredible success. On the morning of December 21st, as Captain Fetterman leads his mixed detachment toward their destiny, Corporal Metzger again rides out this time next to Lieutenant Grummond, who's been placed in charge of the cavalry. What happens next is not exactly clear and will never be known for certain. What is known is that over a thousand warriors ambush and annihilate Fetterman and every soldier and civilian under his command. And this is where Adolf Metzger's mystery really begins. As Colonel Carrington collects his soldiers' stripped bodies, he notes in his report the various mutilations he finds on the bodies. Eyes torn out and laid on the rocks, noses cut off, ears cut off, chins hewn off, teeth chopped out, joints of fingers cut off, brains taken out and placed on rocks with members of the body, entrails taken out and exposed, hands cut off, feet cut off, arms taken out from socket, private parts severed and indecently placed on the person, eyes, ear, mouth, and arms penetrated with spearheads, sticks, and arrows, ribs slashed to separation with knives, skulls severed in every form from chin to crown, Muscles of calves, thighs, stomach, breast, back, arms, and cheek taken out. Punctures upon every sensitive part of the body, even to the soles of the feet and palms of the hand. Pretty gruesome stuff, but all this mutilation is in line with Plains tribes' beliefs and post-battle actions. In fact, Indian accounts at the battle note about 40 women who were present for the purpose of mutilating the dead. Carrington, along with the rest of the men who collected the soldiers' remains, was understandably shocked at these mutilations. But what was even more shocking, at least for one body, was the absence of mutilations. According to Finn Burnett, a civilian teamster who helped haul in the bodies, one body had not been stripped, scalped, or mutilated by the Indians, and had even been covered with a buffalo robe as a sign of respect. This was a rarity in Plains Indians fighting. Obviously, they had singled out this man. The narrative quickly spread throughout the soldiers of Phil Kearney of how Metzger had bravely fought and literally went down swinging using his bugle as a club against the native warriors. There is some confusion as to where Metzger's body was found. Company C's NCOs and experienced soldiers were found on the northern end of the ridge near the Wheatley Fisher Rocks. And a modern day interpretive sign mentioning Metzger is currently on top of the ridge overlooking this position. As one of the more experienced soldiers who knew that standing and fighting offered better odds for survival than running away, it's plausible that Metzger could have died here. But Metzger's duty as a bugler meant he had to stick close to his commanding officer. 
Lieutenant Grumman's body was found further south on the way to Fetterman's position, and multiple sources state they identified a bugler's body near Fetterman, even if they didn't remember his name. It's possible that Metzger made it the entire way back along the ridge. We'll never know for certain. The white soldiers surmised that Metzger's body had been well treated as a sign of respect for what he had done. Today we have access to something those soldiers didn't have, the oral histories and traditions of the tribes who fought Fetterman and his troops. Northern Cheyenne oral tradition, as related by Bill Talbull, mentions, on this ridge, one soldier fought with whatever he could use as a weapon, and he fought like a lion. Many arrows began to appear on his body, and he finally died fighting. This man had shown great courage and fought bravely in a hopeless battle, and he won the admiration of the fighting Indian men. After the battle, they found him covered with arrows, and they respectfully covered his body with a buffalo robe. Great honor had been extended to this one brave soldier named Metzger. Similarly, a relative and descendant of Crazy Horse's tribe provides another great insight into why Metzger could be so respected. According to Douglas War Eagle, the perception among the Oglala warriors was that Metzger had been executed by one of his own officers. They noticed that he did not carry a weapon, only a bugle. According to Douglas War Eagle, this earth man came into our fight with no weapon but a noisemaker that the soldiers act upon its music. Corporal Adolf Metzger was left alone and bravery was seen by our people. No weapon and under order stayed till the end. This earth man lives here honor and respect for this brave man. Wrap him by our people of Buffalo people. A Plains warrior brought up in the notions of counting coup and earning honor through warfare would have instantly grasped the courage it would take to go into battle carrying not a weapon, but a noisemaker. They would have instantly respected any man that did so. The bugle that currently hangs in the Jim Gatchell Museum was found on the field years after the battle and eventually made its way to the museum. It's missing a badge on top that would have identified what company it belonged to, and it has obviously seen better days. But this bugle has come to symbolize something more than just a battered musical instrument. Adolf Metzger came to the United States as a foreigner served his adopted country in one war, and died for it in another. His legacy, along with his bugle, reminds us that even though many of us come from different cultures and traditions, there are common values we all share that unite us. And when we see courage and bravery in action, all of us should feel committed to recognizing and honoring it. And no matter what, never quit and never stop fighting. So now I'd like to hear from you. What do you think about Corporal Metzger's story? Feel free to leave a comment, and if you've enjoyed this story or gotten anything out of it, please click the like button. Thank you.